if people learn that history, when you see these white men from the North, these white men from the South, these formerly enslaved black men got together and created this great document, that might give people hope that that kind of stuff can happen today. Por varios años y varias décadas nos han tratado de separar um, las comunidades, las diversas comunidades que están en este estado. Este momento va a ser un momento histórico porque no nos hemos dado por vencido. La lucha sigue. En 1868, just after the Civil War, a racially diverse group of North Carolina legislators called the Coalition for Justice came together. They wrote in to the North Carolina Constitution the right for all our state's children to have a public education a radical notion at its time. Their work is largely unreported. So 1868, uh, this is Reconstruction, and one of the uh, conditions of readmission into the Union were that the Southern legislatures, the Southern governments, state governments had to rewrite state constitutions. And so this is our Reconstruction Constitution, but it's also the first time that black men, many of whom were formerly enslaved, have the opportunity to help craft the document that's going to govern the state that they live in, the state their families, their children live in. When you talk about the resilience of a people who have been enslaved for hundreds of years, and then these men are born into slavery, teach themselves how to read, and now they have the opportunity to work on this document and help craft it. And we're talking about this multiracial group of people in 1868 who framed our North Carolina Constitution, who came up with this right. And that's not the way we traditionally think about um, framers or drafters of our Constitution. We're the only state that has that in our Declaration of Rights and our Constitution, which is the right to an education. I think they wanted things to be fair, just, and equitable. You know, we, we throw equity around a lot now. It's, it's a great buzzword, but I think those guys were ahead of the curve something that you're working towards is bigger than us. Um, you're working towards a vision of universal public education that's available to all. It says the people have a right uh, to an education, it's something that's bigger than just what's in it for me. It's something that, that's bigger than what's in it for a particular group. Not everyone was happy to extend the right to a public education to every child in North Carolina. White supremacists work to dissolve public schools entirely so to deprive black North Carolinians of their education. The resistance came from those men who would become the redeemers. Uh, those were the people who were opposed to this idea of free public schools in the South. Late 19th century, uh, after the Compromise of 1877, President Hayes removes those remaining federal troops from the South. And so these redeemer politicians are able to take back control of these state governments in the South. And so they start passing um, what becomes Jim Crow laws. Amidst the turmoil of the early 20th century, a moment of hope emerges. The Rosenwald schools and Jeans teachers began spreading out to rural black communities across the state. Oh yeah, we are in Allen Grove, which is one of the few standing, if not the only standing, Rosenwald School. Julius Rosenwald and Booker T have this idea that they're going to build or improve upon education for black children in the South by building these schools that are named after Julius Rosenwald, Rosenwald Schools. North Carolina built more Rosenwald Schools, I believe, than any other southern state. The only thing about it is people think that Julius Rosenwald just poured out all this money. He did, but the communities had to match, or they had to contribute as well. That's one of the things that I think is lost when we talk about Rosenwald schools. It shows how much we valued education. Brown versus Board of Education obviously was in 1954. They fought against it. Lieutenant Governor Hodges, who became the governor when Governor Armstead passed, who put Thomas Pearsall in charge of finding out how we're going to make Brown versus Board work in North Carolina. His whole thing was, you know, if they force integration on us, they're going to destroy the public school system, which was the mantra of a lot of white Southerners during that time. You know, we don't, it's not that we're against integration, just let us, let us do it at our own pace. 
And uh, they came up with a lot of different things to, to fight against integration. The Pearsall Plan was one of them. Public schools of North Carolina are part and parcel of our state and its great progress. But let no one be misled as to how I personally feel about mixing the races in the school. I'm unalterably opposed to it, and I intend to continue seeing that our state uses every lawful and proper means to prevent it. And the recommendations made by our committee furnish us the best possible means of keeping our schools and keeping them segregated. That's when you see that first idea of vouchers introduced in North Carolina. Why? Because of the implementation of Brown versus Board. And here we are, <laughs> decades later, vouchers, opportunity scholarships. Um, they also allowed local districting plans to come into place. So all the way up into 1964, you still had, uh, I think it was less than 1% of black students in North Carolina were actually in integrated schools. I started working with Julius Chambers. He brought a case called Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. Uh, he brought the lawsuit on behalf of plaintiffs that were seeking to integrate the public schools here in Charlotte Mecklenburg. And essentially what the case came down to is it's a we have a violation of Brown versus Board of Education. We have separate and unequal, we have segregated schools. And because that case was won at the U.S. Supreme Court level, Schools all across our nation um, had a remedy by which they could actually integrate schools. And so it's one of our greatest contributions, I think, to the civil rights movement and to the integration of schools across our country. Like the battles in North Carolina before, racism, the state's education system, and legislative power are central parts of the story. In Leandro versus State of North Carolina, a group of rural school districts sued the state for not meeting its constitutional requirement of providing a sound, basic education. The school districts won. With the required funding sitting available, the state's legislature, controlled by conservatives, has resisted enacting a remedy. School districts have watched as three decades have passed since the initial lawsuit, while students and schools go without resources they need. En realidad no creo que haya otro caso tan importante como el caso de Leandro en Carolina del Norte en esos momentos. So el caso de Leandro es un caso que comenzó como hace 27 años que está luchando para mejorar las escuelas públicas, para recaudar más fondos para que vayan directamente a estudiantes y familias afectadas que no estén recibiendo el dinero adecuado y el apoyo adecuado para poder tener una educación básica y sólida. Um, este es un caso cívico porque vemos que es un derecho para nuestros estudiantes que tengan el derecho de ir a la escuela y tener acceso a la, los recursos que necesitan. Que han, han habido generaciones que han pasado por el sistema público que no han recibido la, la educación necesaria que necesitan para poder lograr ser um, exitosos en la vida. Estamos pensando que cierta cantidad de dinero iba a ir a las escuelas públicas, pero ahora vemos que nos están limitando. The context of what's going on now and what was going on almost 30 years ago, I feel like it's disrespectful to those men who met in Raleigh for that extended period of time to craft a document, particularly to those African American men. Again, many of whom have been born into slavery, some of whom had served in the Union Army. Here we are, almost 30 years later, and we still have not met this obligation. In this era that we're in now, you're also seeing uh, reactionary forces, um, and again, trying to prey on fear, uh, trying to prey on factions, uh, operating from a mindset of scarcity as opposed to coalition building. That's the lesson we need to learn from, from what happened in 1868. Are we going to be a country multi-ethnic country, people of different backgrounds, where we can come together, not ignore differences, not paper them over, but build coalitions, find a common vision of what we believe in and work towards it, or not. And how that all factors in to Leandro, then they'll, they'll say, hey, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's give it a shot. And it's not gonna happen overnight. What we see today, the suffering that we see, the inequities that we see, they didn't happen overnight. They were by design. 
Let's erase them by design.